insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 87. A string of unfortunate goodbyes. I am your host, Joseph Whalen, and my spooky and spirited (laughs) co-host, Michelle Whalen. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) (laughs) How you doing today, sweetheart? I'm doing good. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, sweetheart. So, yes, today is Halloween. Mm -hmm. It is our anniversary. Yes. It is... Eight days after Madison's birthday. Correct. It is 11 days after Sam's birthday. Correct. So we have a very busy yes, October. Yes, October's a very <laughs> busy October. It is. Um, and this show's a very busy show. Yeah. We, uh, we were not on uh, last week. Right. Uh, so we have a lot of stuff to catch up on. Uh, we did have a good time at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. We did. We did. Weekend. It, it worked out very well. Kind of nice feeling a little normal you yeah know? yeah it was a great venue everything was outdoors mm-hmm. you could social distance you could you know be as careful as you needed to be mm-hmm. uh, but still have a good time yeah yeah and, and that's uh, that's kind of what i think a lot of people need yeah right now so between that and the pumpkin fest that we went to the week before mm-hmm. A uh, good time of year to get out and do some of the things that we normally do right not too hot not too cold and you can stay safe doing it. Right, right. Um, so, so, good stuff, mm-hmm. good stuff. But today we do have a very busy show. Mm-hmm. And our Disney detective, we're going to be talking about changes to the queue for Star Wars Rise of the Resistance. We have some more unfortunate layoffs at Disney. Then the question of whether annual passes will be going away at Disney Parks. And more bad news for Disneyland Paris closing because of a surge in Corona. Mm -hmm. France. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, we'll talk about the new Star Wars holiday special and some of the crossover aspects of it. Then we have some Mandalorian news here. Uh, We just watched last night the Mm -hmm. premiere of season two. Yeah. Episode one. We'll and talk was, about that, I'm sure. It was awesome. Yes, it was. But uh, we have a little bit of news on that as well. And mm-hmm. then in our entertainment news, uh, Marvel may be retconning the MCU to accommodate X-Men, which would be nice because they've been all over the place with X-Men. <laughs> uh, some Spider-Man 3 <clears throat> news everyone's been waiting for. And then we do get some unfortunate news. Uh, Mine Hunter, a show that you and I both really enjoyed is not coming back for a season three right we'll talk about that and a farewell to my favorite james bond sean connery then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week are we ready to get started sure okay well before we get started (laughs) that hesitation was very helpful thank you thanks Um, (laughs) Before we get started, uh, I would encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get a, our video podcasts uh, are listed as, as Insights into Things. Our audio podcasts are listed as Insights into Entertainment. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and Amazon. We'd also love to get your feedback. Are we doing a good job? What do you want us to talk about? What don't you want us to talk about? You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. Uh, we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things. And on Instagram, we are uh, in at insights into things. 
And you can get links to all of our social media content and all of our videos and audio recordings on our website at insightsintothings.com. Now, are we ready? Yes. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Go for Disney Detective. So Star Wars Rise of the Resistance has obviously been a park favorite since it opened at Disney's Hollywood studio back in December of 2019. So from the beginning, the ride had a virtual queue that allowed guests to enjoy other park rides while they were waiting for their boarding pass to be called. And we got to experience that. Uh, when we were there last December, actually. Um, but after the theme park closed due to COVID and then reopened in July, certain measures had to be put into place to allow for new health and safety regulations. So now Disney's Hollywood Studios are now going to allow guests with a valid theme park ticket on November 3rd to check in for a boarding pass as early as 7 a.m. from your hotel. Uh, meanwhile, now this means that guests don't have to rush to the park to try and get a boarding pass uh, first thing in the morning um, when they normally uh, start distributing at uh, 10 a.m. So and then there'll be a second round of boarding groups that will be signed at 2 p.m. But for the 2 p.m., the guests actually have to be in the park for that. Um and now they've actually added uh, plexiglass dividers to um, to the ride between the front seat and uh, the middle seats. So now they can actually fit more people on the ride because before they were only putting people in the front and the very back. Now they've added plexiglass so they can actually accommodate more more guests, you know, on the ride. Um we got to, you know, like I said, we got to experience it last year. Um, we got to the park, what, an hour and a half before the park even opened. Uh, they were letting people in the park a little early. Not that you could really do anything but kind of walk around because no rides were open at the time. And we had, I think it was a 7 a.m., uh, that you were allowed to to try and get in the queue. We managed to to get a spot. Um, we didn't get on until what about twelve o'clock, one o'clock, I think. About that, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was really nice because we got to go and do other things while we were waiting for our our, our boarding pass. So it was kind of like having a fast pass, but but different um, because it didn't take away from having a fast pass for something else. Now, obviously, with what's going on right now, they're not doing fast passes, but it's nice that they're seeing that they have something good in place and kind of, you know, modifying it and, and keeping it and not getting rid of it. Because we kind of thought, <clears throat> you know, after maybe a year, they were going to get rid of the virtual queue. But it's nice to see that it's, it's still going and, you know, people are, are finding, you know, uh, Disney's realizing that they have a good thing and, and, you know, to keep it going. So, yeah. And, you know, I thought this was a brilliant move to begin with when we were down there and mm -hmm. gave you the ability to get on it. The fact that they're extending this to people at the resorts mm -hmm. now for that early shift, I think is even better because mm -hmm. that rush to get there, there right. was that, that huge anxiety. And within, what, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, all the slots had been taken right, up at right. that point in time. Um, so, and if, like, we were only in the park for the one day. Mm -hmm. So if you can't get one of those slots, you really run the risk of, of basically not getting on that ride on your, your right. day in the park. Right. And now at least they've opened it. So they do two slots. So they have the, the early morning slot. Then they do another one at 2 PM. So at least you have a, an, another <clears throat> opportunity to try and get it. Or if you're just somebody that doesn't want to wake up so early to try and get it. Or if you're not it. staying at the park. Right. I mean, you, not everyone who goes to Disney right, stays true. on property. True. Not everybody that stays on property. So, so even right. those people have an opportunity to still to try get, and get something. not just reserving it for your yeah. resort guests, yeah. which is so, nice. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a good way for Disney to do that. And honestly, I think given, I mean, even before COVID, 
they needed to do something with their line management. Mm-hmm. This was a great idea. With COVID, this is this is a brilliant fit mm-hmm. for COVID. So people are not congregating in one because when right. we did it. Everybody was liter- literally in the front of the park there. On oh, their phones yeah, that to get morning, that you know, yeah, now at least they're not going to have that surge of people. I'm right. sure there's still going to be people getting there first thing in the morning for right, those but, that aren't but staying at the, the park. the park wasn't open, right. everybody was congregating oh, absolutely. in one area, which right. just would not work with Right, COVID. now they, they would have to. And that's even, and you see, if you look at pictures from the park now, because they're not doing fast pass, so you have to wait on on the the line for the rides and some of the rides have you know half hour 45 minute you know some even have a, about an hour but where normally they kind of crunch you all together now they're spacing it so far out where you're like a half a mile yeah. away from the ride so everybody's getting their steps in you know more yeah. so because for like slinky dog i think the wait was like 45 minutes which really isn't bad for for slinky dog but because it was stretched out so far it was all the way by the little mermaid show well and it doesn't make sense that they're not doing fast passes if anything you should exclusively do fast passes right. so you can regulate the line yeah i that that That's would kind of make yeah like give people the option to do like four or five right you know or open up more virtual queues yeah like do this. more virtual queues well and maybe you know, that's a, something this is a winning formula that they have that they need to be smart about and they need yeah to and maybe maybe they'll you know they'll look at that yeah you know so, so. but good to see it's working out yeah. that they're expanding it yeah tell us about the unfortunate layoffs we're looking for so you know, unfortunately, within, you know, the last week, you know, we knew a couple of weeks ago, a lot of uh, part time employees were were being uh, part time cast members, I should say, were being let go. Um, and now we got news that, you know, more of the entertainment group um, has been let go. Uh, so at first, you know, it, it sounded like some of uh, the Dapper Dan's and some of the other musical groups were going to be saved. And now a lot of those uh, cast members, as well as cast members from various shows, even uh, the dinner shows like the Hoopty Doo Review, that they all got notifications that they have now all been laid off. Uh, some of the others uh, that were laid off were the citizens of Hollywood, um, basically sort of street misphere characters that would walk around either Main Street in the Magic Kingdom or down Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood Studios. Um, Also, the Beauty and the Beast live show, Finding Nemo and Friends, Festival of the Lion King, um, even some of the areas where you could go and meet uh, cast members, those uh, or meet different characters like at uh, the laugh floor in the magic kingdom. They're not going to be um, welcoming guests anymore. So it's, it's definitely a going to be a different feel um, to, to the park. Uh, in some areas you can still see characters. They kind of have them in, in kind of like grassy areas where you can kind of wave and, and do kind of a selfie with, you know, with them in the background. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely going to be a very, uh, different feel. Um, you know, you're used to going and, and, you know, if it's something where you've never had interaction with the characters before, you've, you know, you've probably seen them, um, or even any of the music. If you've never gone to the show, but you hear different musical performers, street performers as you're going by, um, you know, now it's, you know, pretty much there's <laughs> almost no entertainment, uh, you know, at all at, at this point. So yeah. we're very, very this, limited. I think is, is probably the most unfortunate mm-hmm. turn that we've seen so far because it's really, you know, you can understand if you're shutting the parks down and you have to lay people off. Right. But now you're taking away from what makes Disney magical. Right. Disney has always been that. As artificial as everything at Disney is, they strive to provide you that that next level of service mm-hmm. and, and and atmosphere. Yeah, and to see them start whittling away at this, uh, you know, we talked in the last podcast about the band at the Grand Floridian. Mm-hmm. 
you know, having to let those and, and other music performers go. But I think this is really what distinguishes Disney from right, other theme from parks. Right, from any other theme park, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you go to a theme park to go on rides in most cases. I don't do rides, really. Right. I go for the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So what they're whittling away here at now, and, and I'm I'm assuming, I'm going to go out on a, on a limb here, play devil's advocate and say that they probably have a justifiable financial reason for this. But they're doing this. They're not decreasing ticket prices. So your your experience at Disney is greatly diminished. And I'm curious how many how many executives have been laid off during this whole thing? Right. I'm guessing none. Probably not. So you're you're killing what the draw is, mm-hmm. which is going to kill your business even further, yet you still have executives making hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Mm-hmm. So I think Disney needs to get their priorities straight at mm-hmm. this point in time. Yeah. Uh, I have no intention of going back down under the conditions. And I'm not talking COVID conditions. I'm talking the fact that Disney is doing everything they can to squeeze every penny out of the money that they're getting from their customers at this point in time. And it's it's affecting the experience at this point. I think this is probably a bad idea. Mm-hmm. I think you're ruining the experience for the people. We go down... I mean, we've gone down three times in a year. We go down a lot. Right, right. The average family, it's a once in a lifetime experience. And you're going to rip all of this atmosphere away for someone who might go down there once. And you're going to ruin that experience for them. That's just criminal. Mm. And that's not even touching on the human aspect of the people that you're putting out of work for why? What reason are they giving for these layoffs? Is it financial? Is it safety reasons? Like, what are the reasoning that they're giving for the layout? I'm sure it's financial at this point. You know, they know the park isn't because they can't do it at full capacity. You know, the park's probably not making, you know, as much money. You know, they're probably still hurting from when they they were closed. And you figure Disneyland is still closed. So that's a whole, you know, you have two whole parks over there. See, and I have to question, considering the amount of money that they made Mm -hmm. when it was open at full capacity, they were printing money. You know, their, their margins on ticket prices and food and souvenirs, it's, they have like a 300% markup on everything. So don't tell me that they're, they're losing money. They're just not making as much money. Right. Because I guarantee you that Disneyland, uh, I'm sorry, Disney World would not be open if Disney wasn't making money. You're probably right. It's about time I swing back this way. Because, you know, <laughs> I've been defending Disney in the last couple I of weeks. I know. I'm very, very, so I, I very had to get that out. I had to get that <laughs> off my better? chest there. It's been building up the last <laughs> few weeks. Get it out. Get it out. So um, let's talk about... Annual passes because we've been annual pass holders. Yeah. We haven't the last year or two, but yeah. Let's talk so about the changes. you know, with everything kind of changing, will 2020 now mark the end of annual passes for Disneyland and Walt Disney World? Um, so Tokyo Disney actually had announced that at least for now, the park is ending its annual pass program entirely. Previously. Uh, was the case with uh, the stateside park. Guests who had annual passes had the expiration of those passes extend to a future date equivalent to the amount of time that the parks were closed due to the pandemic. However, now that the extension has been canceled and guests with annual passes need to simply apply uh, for refunds, we could actually see that maybe the annual passes don't return at all or maybe turn into something else. Now, just, you know, in case you're not aware, Tokyo Disney Resort is not actually owned or operated by the Walt Disney Company. So the change in policy is not a Disney policy. It's just specific to that park. Um, but it could be something that the other parks uh, stateside actually might consider uh, doing. Um, and obviously, it's a simple fact and, and kind of 
touching on what you uh, just kind of mentioned is that guests with annual passes don't spend as much money as guests that use a standard ticket. Um, while the income from the pass itself is obviously valuable, guests that go to Disneyland or Walt Disney World with an annual pass aren't going and getting all that merchandise every time that they go. They're not buying meals every time they go. Um, you know, a lot of the people that are very local might just go for a couple of hours just to walk around and then head home, whereas other people that go, again, multiple times a year because they know they're going to be back, well, I don't need to eat at this place. I'll just get fast food or you know, uh, I don't need to buy the merchandise because I already have that versus somebody who's only there that once in a lifetime or once every few year trip. Um, so kind of interesting to to see what they end up, you know, doing with that. Is it something where they kind of consider it? Now, the other thing, too, is that Tokyo, along with uh, Disneyland and California are very much more of a locals park, so they do tend to have a lot more people that have annual passes. So if you get rid of the annual pass, how is that going to affect your overall attendance? Are you even going to have as much attendance as you normally would without it? Or do you create something else, you know, not an annual pass, but something a little different to kind of entice those local people. Um, I know with, with Florida, they have variations of annual passes. They have uh, a strictly after four Epcot pass, or they have the various ones that have the blackout dates um, and things like that. And the other thing too is how does that affect, because right now you need to make a reservation for the park. So if you're staying at the resorts, you have to actually specify which park you're going to go in on what day because there's no park hopping or whatnot. And then the same thing if you're an annual pass holder, if you're not staying on property, you have to go and make a reservation. And that's probably going to be the case for a while. So I could see where they kind of phase out the annual passes for now, because I, I know there's been some changes to the the policies and a lot of people aren't renewing them as of now because they don't like the the policy changes that have been coming into place so maybe it's something they just kind of so is disneyland tokyo open right now yes i believe they still are okay so they're open they're doing away. They're giving refunds for anyone who had, I guess, the prorated refunds for whatever time you had. Right, left. right. Okay. And are they doing reservations at that point in time? For I believe they are park? still do. I, I think all of the parks, you oh, have okay. to have a reservation. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the advantage of, of annual passes to Disney is the recurring revenue they can, mm -hmm. they can book. They, right. You know, they know they're getting it. Right. And while you may have people like, you know, my, my boss out in California, you know, they don't get their annual passes to Disneyland every year. They may skip a year here and there and get something else. Right. But when they have them, that's exactly what they do. They may go out there cause they're not that far from mm -hmm. the park. They may just head over for lunch and eat lunch over there, mm -hmm. or they may take a walk after dinner over there or something like that. Right. Just for the ambiance. Mm -hmm. But I think. To, to say that they're not booking as much money off of those people is probably not that accurate because you might not be doing it per trip. But I think if you look at it over the course of a year or multiple right. years, they're spending more than the family that goes there once a year. I could see a that. A lifetime thing. Yeah, I could see that. Plus, they're the people that are probably buying the higher end merchandise, mm. staying at the higher end uh, resort hotels that you have there. You know, they're the ones that are eating at the the higher end restaurants. You know, they're right because they know about them right. more you so. Know, they're than the insiders, the right? Yeah, they're not the I people that. that are going and staying at All Stars and eating, you know, quick syrup because they've, you know, they're trying to do it on a budget. Right, right. These are people that you know, it's it's just like eating at a local restaurant for us. Yeah, I could see that. Um, so I I, I think if they do away with it, they're gonna it's gonna really hurt hurt business and it's gonna hurt the fans. Yeah. 
it looks like Disney was making all the right decisions early on in this pandemic. And it looks like almost desperation now where they're making decisions that are more business centric and less customer centric. Mm. And ultimately in the long run, that's going to cost you. Even Disney's brand can erode. Yeah. You know, we've seen that happen in the Mm eighties where they allowed the brand to erode. So if they're not smart and they don't play the right game, then they're going to lose more money in the long run. Yeah. Speaking of losing money, what (sighs) happened to Disneyland Paris? Yeah. So obviously, you know, French authorities um, had made a a decision because they're having spikes in COVID cases uh, that Disneyland Paris actually closed at the end of day on October 29th. Um, They were actually getting ready to, to, start doing their Christmas season. Um, and they actually had uh, posted a, a note saying that in anticipation of celebrating the Christmas holiday season, we will be taking reservations from December 19th to January 3rd and hope to be opened uh, based on prevailing conditions and government guidance at that time. Disneyland Paris will be closed from January 4th through February 12th. Please check back on the website for regular updates. If you have a booking with us during the above mentioned period, please check here for our latest commercial conditions. And they had a a link available. So they had opened up. Things seemed to be going okay. And just in general, you know, the country started seeing spikes. So it was mandated for, you know, parks and other things to, to close. So, they are hoping to be open, you know, for a couple of weeks for Christmas, then close back again for about a month and a half and hoping that by February things can can be a little normal again. Now, this is by government mandated. This, mm-hmm. point. this, isn't, this isn't just Disney mm-hmm. deciding no. from an overabundance of quality. Right, right, right. Yeah. This is, this is the government. So. Right. So there's not much. It's like California. There mm-hmm. isn't much they can do. Right. Uh, we do know that the the uh, state representatives from California had gone to Florida, right, to kind of to see. look at the methods that were being done at the theme parks there. Yeah. Nothing's come of that Mm-mm. so far, as far yeah. as announcements or anything. But should California decide to adopt some of those and, and reopen, it, it might be an influence on France as yeah. well. But again, you know, they're they're basically closing down a, a long medical guidelines at this point for quarantine right. situations. Now, they had announced that some of California Adventure was going to be opening, but kind of along the lines of Knott's Berry Farms, where it's just the food and shopping area. So along with uh, Disney Springs, which is their shopping district, they are going to be opening parts of uh, the park as well. But again, just for shopping, just for dining, you won't need a ticket. I don't know if you're going to need a reservation uh, for it. So, you know, they're starting to open up a little bit. But again, it's not the rides. It's not uh, right. both parks. It's just a, a little section of it. It's so, something. But it's right? something. It's, it's something. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, hopefully they can stick to their schedule and, and reopen and do it safe. Yeah, there was kind of a, a, after the whole thing with Paris, there was a separate article on one of the business uh, websites that said, you know, could California actually open before Paris opens back up? You know, because right now there there's no time frame, yeah. you know, for California. At least Paris has some kind of a. Right, right. An end at the tunnel. So well, hopefully we'll we'll start start getting back to normal or some sense of normal soon. Yeah. So, but Here's that was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm-hmm. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. For over seven years. The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. 
Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Pew, 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 it's pew. Not pew, pew. I know. So, the Star Wars Holiday Special is coming to Disney Plus uh, the end of next month. And it'll like, and it's obviously very unlike the original of the same name. And this actually sounds like it won't scar us for life, hopefully. Um, so, talking to Entertainment Weekly, the executive producer had said the holiday special has something you will never see in Star Wars otherwise, which is all of the characters from across all timelines kind of crashing in together. Normally, story groups are so concerned about maintaining this amazing galaxy so that it feels cohesive uh, and it was liberating to do this in a way that was charming and fun. Uh, so it's kind of like um, if you've ever played any of the Star Wars Lego games where you can kind of mix up your characters uh, while you're playing the game, this is kind of going to be the same thing for uh, the holiday special. So currently confirmed is that Rey will be fighting her grandfather's former apprentice, Darth Vader, in one scene, while all three errors of Obi-Wan, presumably Padawan, bearded ear, uh, Ewan McGregor, and Alec Guinness, are all featured in a scene together. So that's going to be kind of cool to to have all of them uh it'll be like you know a doctor who special i was just gonna say it's a doctor doctors. who special with all the different doctors uh so the ho the star wars holiday special will take place following the events of star wars rise of skywalker um life day which is the one <laughs> remaining thread from the original holiday special uh will kind of be you know celebrated um and Rey ends up in a Jedi temple that pushes her back in time and experiencing several iconic moments. So that's... Are we going to see Wookiees in red dresses, though? I don't know. It did Cause, not say. Because that holiday special had some compelling dialogue. <laughs> from the yeah, that was really it. Um, so we don't have a long wait. Um, the Star Wars holiday special will be airing on November 17th, obviously only on Disney Plus. So not too long uh, to, to wait because it's already the 31st of, oh my God, it's the 31st of Blursville. <laughs> yeah. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Oh, look at that. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it should be fun. Should be fun. Tell us about the Mando. So obviously we are now negative one day from the airing of season two of The Mandalorian. We happened to watch it last night and it was fantastic. It was everything we wanted it to be and even more. Um, we did even catch... Um, later on in the evening, they had a red carpet, virtual red carpet event, um, that was, uh, streaming on Twitter. We actually, you know, caught that, um, as well. So that was kind of cool to see. Um, so, um, uh, Giancarlo Esposito was actually, uh, talking, uh, I don't know who, I think it, don't know what. Uh, oh, it was Good Morning America. Uh, he was being interviewed and talking talking about his character, um, you know, making such a memorable appearance in the first season. And what could, you know, you, you we look forward to, you know, for season two. And he said that his character is kind of the warden of the galaxy. He's a remnant of the Imperial uh, Empire and that he's still searching for his quarry, which... Uh, you know, that we kind of hope that that he'll find. He said he's, you know, so happy to be part of that show that really uh, depicts a story about humanity and heroism. Um, and he, you know, and and he says that, you know, he's played different villains, but he really loves 
you know, playing this character because he thinks in a lot of cases he's he's a hero of, you know, the the galaxy. Um, he says that, you know, Star Wars is iconic. And um, as we've heard him mention before, he, you know, would I have rather have been in a movie or the television show? And he says that he thinks he totally made the right choice because, you know, for him, it's just an empowering moment being in the Mandalorian, you know, where we are right now. So we didn't get to see him in, you know, this first episode, but I'm sure he's going to be, you know, making his appearance at, at some point w- within the season. So, yeah. And it's, it's kind of cool. The character that he plays because the time span from return of the Jedi to force awakens, something happens, right? You know, the empire is not there, but the first order rises. So there's some t- type of transitionary period here. And we're a few years after return of the Jedi here. And we see that the empire still kind of exists. Mm-hmm. So what's really cool is he's going to sort of bridge part of that gap for us mm-hmm. and, and kind of put us on our path to where the for the first order rises. So a very cool transitionary thing that we're looking at here and he has a cool weapon and he does have a cool weapon which i have nudge nudge too because the best wife in the world (gasps) got it for me for our anniversary i didn't bring it up i should have brought it up you should have along with your other star warsy stuff yeah i got a lot of star wars stuff today because somebody loves you yes yes someone does and when i figure out who it is i'm gonna let them know what i think (laughs) you give them a piece of your mind (laughs) Uh, that was all we had for our tales from the edge of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So Marvel might be uh, retconning the MCU to accommodate the X-Men. So characters of Wanda and Pietro uh, were introduced in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in Avengers Age of Ultron. Obviously, if you haven't seen it, spoilers, Wanda was the only one that made it out alive. Um, Since then, she's obviously gone to have an important role in the franchise and is actually going to be part of her own show, WandaVision, which will be airing uh, in December on Disney+. Plus. But there's always been kind of something weird. So Wanda and her brother are technically from the X-Men comics because they're mutants. Um, Pietro has the mutant ability to run really fast, and Wanda has the ability to control probability. Um... So, so far, Marvel Marvel could could never say that they were mutants in the movies because 20th Century Fox had the film rights to X-Men. But now Disney obviously owns 20th Century Fox, so it's only a matter of time um, between Wolverine, Cyclops, um, and, and Jean Grey to be introduced into the MCU. So, obviously, where does that leave Wanda. Um, She's been a mutant this whole time, or will Marvel stick with their original explanation that she and her brother gained their powers after being exposed to the Mind Stone in Loki's scepter? Uh, Well, it looks like the studio may have found a middle path. So there is a new 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, in-universe book out called The Wakanda Files. Um, and it's a exploration of the Avengers and beyond. And it's comprised of notes on all things Marvel lore, which is supposed to be compiled blo- by Black Panther's sister, Shuri. And it has some interesting notes about the siblings. One such note comes from uh, Baron von, von Stucker, who did experiments involving the Mind Stone on human test subjects, although Wanda and her brother were the only ones who survived. Um, Stucker notes that the twins had the appropriate genetic marker that makes them conducive for human trial volunteers. So that was kind of how they they slipped it in. So are they going to stick with that or are they going to kind of fish it around and, and bring in, you know, other mutants calling the mutants or, or other things. So maybe we'll find out a little bit more once one division, you know, drops uh, in December. So, and, and you know, it's, it's kind of hard to think why you kind of need to go that route. You know, the Marvel cinematic universe right now is huge. Mm-hmm. If you add, I mean, they're talking, we're talking about adding Spider-Man in, you know, on a regular basis. You're mm-hmm. talking about bringing the X-Men universe into it. I think considering the path that they went down, you could conceivably from a story standpoint say that, uh, but you also have to look at what else they've done. You know, they, they in uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., mm-hmm. we got the Inhumans who have the right. genetic marker for the transgenesis. True, true. You know, so there's there's all kinds of directions that they can go with this. Honestly, I think if they go the route, since you already killed off Quicksilver, mm-hmm. I think you probably are, are safer going off and, and keeping her as a separate character in the MCU and sticking to that storyline. Uh, but it should be interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's good to know they've got options now, right? Right, right. Uh, where you know. 10 years ago, we were all itching to see these crossovers and everything else. Right. And they just and they couldn't, couldn't do it because of licensing. Right, right. Uh, Marvel, <laughs> Marvel really did a, a mess of a job with their licensing for movies. Yeah. You, you know. can have these three, you can have these guys, and you can have these guys, but none of us will ever talk yeah. together. Yeah. So. They, had they been smarter, you know, kind of like Disney was with, uh, or not Disney, but uh, Star Wars was mm. with their licensing. Yeah. They retained all the licensing rights, and they basically leased those licensing rights out to booksellers and game makers yeah. and software developers. But ultimately, Lucas still owned everything. Mm-hmm. It's a shame that Marvel didn't do that because it would have cleaned this up a lot quicker. Right, right. But then maybe it wouldn't have been, I don't know, maybe because some of the Marvel stuff that came out from other areas wasn't as as good so oh, absolutely. absolutely you know i wonder if you would have gotten that same quality yeah. you know maybe it kind of needed you know i don't know or maybe if it was in the right hand it could have been better from well, the beginning and remember so. we didn't really get the quality <clears throat> stuff until disney acquired yeah marvel yeah true so had marvel stuck to the lucas model and just licensed their stuff out when Disney got it, they would have gotten the entire thing. With True, it, yeah. Which would have just been a much cleaner transition. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in the meantime, let's talk about Spider-Man and hey, Muddy the Waters we even were, more. Well, since we were talking about <laughs> Spider-Man, so obviously Tom Holland has had a very successful run at Spider-Man. Um, he debuted in Captain America Civil War. Um, then we had, you know, the Spider-Man Homecoming and Spider-Man Far From Home. He was also in Infinity Wars and Endgame. And then we had all this, you know, problems um, between Sony and and Marvel Studios because, again, of, of the licensing issues. Um, so, again, we were hoping that you know, a new Spider-Man was going to come out, then we weren't sure if it was. So now it seems that Spider-Man 3 is on the table again. Originally, it was going to be coming out in July of 2021. Then it got moved to November. And now we actually have a December 17th, 2021 date. So at least 
it's something for next year. It's just obviously pushed out later. Um, last Sunday, uh, Tom Holland had actually posted an Instagram story um, in which he revealed that filming of Spider-Man 3 was a go and that he had just landed on location in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and he had said, OK, so we just landed in Atlanta. It's time for Spider-Man 3. Let's go. So, of course, very exciting news that, you know, he's back to work and, and that um, filming has started. Um, some more information has been coming out about the movie and that we learned that Doctor Strange will be making a an appearance and that also um, a shocking comeback for Jamie Foxx's Electro, who actually last faced Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man in the amazing Spider-Man two will be making an appearance. So now this has a couple of fans maybe speculating that Spider-Man three might actually be a live action version, uh, spider verse version that maybe Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire maybe would be joining possibly uh, in this this movie. So again, a lot of speculation on that part of it, but kind of cool that there's going to be some other, you know, crossover characters in uh, in this episode. So uh, so unfortunately, again, a little bit of a delay for this one, but this will be next December of uh, 2021 for this one. And that's exciting news. I, you know, mm-hmm. the, the prospect that it could be a crossover, mm-hmm. you know, an into the yeah. Spider-Verse type thing. It'd be a great intro for the Miles Morales character mm-hmm. and still allow you to keep your, you know, the Spider-Man that you like, right? Because everyone seems just like... Everybody has a Spider-Man they just like. Just like yeah. James Bond and Doctor Who, everyone has their, their favorite Spider-Man. Right, right. So that, that'll be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Speaking of James Bond... Not yet. We'll get to that. (laughs) But before that, we have other bad news to talk about. Yeah, so one of our favorite uh, shows from Netflix uh, is Mindhunter. And they had two seasons on Netflix. Um, Originally, they had been talking about a season three. And now it seems that it isn't going to be happening, at least as of now. Um, So the producer and director... Um, delivered the sad news, but it wasn't kind of, you know, it was kind of not ex- unexpected. Um, he was actually being interviewed talking about his upcoming Netflix film, uh, The Mank. And he mentioned that he had decided to make The Mank after exhausting years uh, spending uh, that he, uh, you know, he he was exhausted after spending so much time making the first two seasons of the of Mindhunter. Uh, he said we had done the first two seasons of Mindhunter without a showrunner, with me pinch hitting on a week by week basis. We started getting scripts for the second season, and I ended up looking at what was written and decided I can't take any of it. So we tossed it and started all over again. Um, then he brought in. Um, some people to kind of help him, you know, write it and ended up doing, you know, some, some co-show running. Um, but it ended up being a 90 hour work week and it absorbs everything in your life. And he said when he got done, he was pretty much exhausted. And he said, I don't know if I could, you know, do a third season at this point. Um, so rather than fighting for another season, he said that Netflix executives asked him if they would rather, you know, he rather what he rather work on. And that's when this new movie that he he's working on, The Mank, um, kind of came to be. He said, listen, for the viewership that it had, it was an expensive show. We talked about finish Mank and then see how you feel. But I honestly don't think that we're going to be able to do it for less than what I did season two for. And on the same level, you have to be realistic about dollars having equal eyeballs. So I don't know, maybe it'll be something in a couple of years, you know, he decides to to go back and finish it or maybe you know a different producer comes in and and you know takes it because that's you know happened before with with various shows that still had a following you know but they kind of changed you know changed hands we it was a very well written show Mm -hmm. incredibly subliminal Mm -hmm. um, and incredibly well acted and Mm -hmm. produced 
Well, if it doesn't come back, it'll be missed. It'd be yeah. nice if it came back, though. Yeah, yeah. So now... Yeah, so this morning news broke that the Scottish actor, best known for his portrayal of James Bond, being the first to bring the role to the big screen and appearing in seven of the spy thrillers, has passed away. Um, Sean Connery died peacefully in his sleep in the Bahamas, having been unwell for some time, uh, his son had said. His acting career spanned five decades, and he won an Oscar in 1988 for his role in The Untouchables. Sean's other films included your favorite, uh, The Hunt for Red October. One ping only, Vasily. <laughs> Highlander. There can be only one. Indiana Jones of the Last Crusade. Signs? What? Oh, no, sorry. That was a different movie. <laughs> and The Rock. We named the dog Indiana. <laughs> there you go. See, I knew you'd be, I knew you wouldn't disappoint. Uh, his son had said that his father had had many of his family who could be in the Bahamas around him when he died overnight in Nassau. Much of the Bond films, uh, much of the Bond film Thunderball had actually been filmed there. Uh, he said, we are all working at understanding this huge event as it only happened so recently, even though my dad had been unwell for some time. Uh, sad day for all who knew and loved my dad and a sad loss for all the people around the world who enjoyed the wonderful gift he had had uh, as an actor. Uh, his publicist had said that there would be a private ceremony followed by a memorial yet to be planned once, obviously, the virus had pla uh, had ended and he leaves behind a wife and two sons. That is unfortunate. He was one of my favorite actors of all time. Mm -hmm. He's one of those people that could, could slip into just about any role mm -hmm. and pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which he proved when he was in The Rock because that was so out of character. For <laughs> yeah. Him. Yeah. It really was. <laughs> so uh, he will be missed. Mm -hmm. he will Absolutely. Be missed. Uh, and that is all we had for entertainment news. We'll be back in a moment with our insightful picks of the week. <laughs> Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick of the week is definitely a themed uh, <laughs> for for this season. Uh, it is Eli Roth's History of Horror. Um, there are two seasons. Uh, the current season on AMC is season two. There have been three episodes so far in this season. And season one, you can actually find it on Amazon, um, but you actually have to, it's not part of Amazon Prime. You actually have to pay for the episodes or have some sort of add-on to be able to to watch them, because I was going to try and go back and, and watch some of the older ones. So that kind of stunk. But anyway, um, so Masters of Horror, icons and stars who define the genre, join writer, producer, director Eli Roth to explore horror's biggest themes and reveal the inspirations and struggles behind its past and present. Each episode is an hour long and it features A-list storytellers like Stephen King, Quentin Tarantino, Jordan Peele, Jason Bloom, um, Robert Engel, Linda Blair, Rob Zombie, Jack Black, uh, John Landis, and Jamie Lee Curtis, who, who discuss how horror has evolved through the years and impacted society, as well as how the genre remains uh, its fan base and why audiences are addicted to fear. What's really cool is each episode is a different theme. Um, so one they talked about just haunted houses and just how the house itself in, in certain movies was the main character and, and how it made you feel. And, you know, the, the houses that looked nice and pristine, but yet had a dark secret to it versus, you know, the, the houses that as soon as you looked at it, you knew it was a, a haunted house. Um, so really kind of interesting. And, and again, they, they show these scenes of, of movies and, and they talk about them. And then they, they talk with not only, uh, people that made the movies or people that starred in the movies or wrote the movies. Um, you know, but they give you a, a different perspective, you know, on it. And they even give you, you know, some little, 
backstories that you might not have known how, you know, this one was paying homage to this one and, and this one was kind of this. And, you know, and, you know, they even talk about how certain films when they came out, you know, tanked, but then ended up getting a cult following later on and or you know who was kind of pushing the boundaries of this and and you know why we like to be scared so really interesting uh it does get gory so it's definitely not something you know for the kids to watch um because they do show you uh you know some some gory scenes but if you're into horror and like that genre it's a very interesting documentary uh to to watch cool pick thank you So my pick this week is uh, a documentary, but it is themed to the season, but not to Halloween. It's themed more to the political season. My pick is a documentary called Why We Fight on Amazon Prime. Winner of the 2005 Grand Jury Prize at the Sundance Film Festival, Eugene Jakeki's groundbreaking docu- documentary dissects the political, economic, and historic reasons behind our increasingly aggressive military strategy since the end of World War II. Fans of Oliver Stone's JFK will recognize the opening moments of writer-director Eugene J- 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 I can't pronounce his name. Jarecki's? Jarecki's? Why we sure. fight? <laughs> In which... Outgoing President Dwight Eisenhower warns of the pernicious and growing influence of what he called the, quote, military-industrial complex. But Stone's movie, which uses the same footage, was a work of fiction. While those who disagree with the decidedly leftist point of view in this documentary will probably consider the product of a paranoid liberal fantasy as well, there's enough credible material much of it supplied by the targets of Jarecki's criticisms to make Eisenhower look like a prophet and everyone else uneasy about the dark confluence of politics, money, and war that controls the country's fortunes. The message here is that while there may be uh, some who sincerely believe that America's various military engagements in Iraq, Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, and elsewhere since World War II are the product of our God-given duty to spread freedom and halt the influence of evil ideologies around the world. The real reason we fight is that war is good for business. And that is the sad reality of it. We'll be back in a minute. So that is all we have for today. Sure is. Did you have any afterthoughts? Mm, I love you. I love you too, sweetheart. (laughs) Uh, In that case, let's just finish up some quick business here. We are publishing now live on, well, not now live. Not right now. I'm not actually publishing right now. But we do publish (laughs) long form articles on Medium (sighs) at medium.com slash insights into things. Again, we, we implore you to subscribe to the podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, iHeart Radio, TuneIn. And Amazon. Uh, Again, our videos are listed as insights into things. Our audio is listed as insights into entertainment. Uh, We do stream on Twitch six days a week uh, at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime member, you do get a free Twitch Prime subscription monthly that you can throw our way, which helps us out tremendously. Or you can reach out to us via email at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We're also on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. Audio versions of the podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Or for all of our videos, including insights into teens and insights into tomorrow, you can go to youtube.com backslash insights into things. Or you you can get links to all that plus show notes transcriptions and profiles of the show hosts on our website <laughs> at insights into things.com 
And I think that's it. I think it is. Another one in the book. Have a good week, everyone. Bye and happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Thank you.